you have a reputation of having a somewhat unique approach to cross-examining chiropractors. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, early in my practice, I found out that uh, chiropractors were costing my client, which was the insurance company, usually a lot of money in the sense that uh, there was a formula used which was not scientific at all, but used by uh, insurance adjusters and a lot of lawyers by taking the amount of specials and d d multiplying them by some figure, whether it be four or five or whatever it would be. You would take your medical expenses, your loss of wages, and, and, uh, and uh, to arrive at the value of a, of a case for, for settlement purposes. I say it wasn't scientific at all. But I learned early in my practice that uh, in representing defendants, insurance companies, that uh, for the ordinary uh, whiplash uh, injury, which I would call a, a uh, sprain or a strain without any, uh, without any uh, joint or, uh, or bone involvement with just soft tissue injury, that usually the client was going to to get well within a few weeks, whether whatever was done, because the natural healing process. Well, if the and I, and I believe that that a, a, a motorist who's rear-ended pretty violently will have a sore back or neck the next day, and and will 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 need some attention. And when I found that ones that went to the uh, general practitioners or the orthopedics would usually be given some muscle relaxants and uh, some uh, anti-inflammatory medicine. And in, in, a, in a few weeks, uh, they would get better. And the bills, the medical expenses would be fairly uh, nominal, small. But if the same patient, same injury went to a chiropractor, they would be wound up going every day to that chiropractor. Plus there would be an initial examination, a series of x-rays, which would run sometime from 600 to $1,000. And I observed with a, with a patient went in with a, with a, with a say with a, uh, a sore neck, the chiropractor would take x-rays of uh, all parts of the, of the spine, the, the lumbar, thoracic, as well as the cervical spine, and would have the patient coming back every day and you would usually have a chiropractor bills of, of uh, five thousand or, or uh, ten thousand dollars. Well, you could tell, see, you could easily tell how the, when you use that multiples, how the cases were being, the value was being enhanced by using those chiropractors. Well, I had read enough about chiropractors, and I really didn't believe the treatment was was any more valuable than. than uh, a little physical therapy really is about the only beneficial uh, benefit to come out of it was physical therapy. And but we weren't exposed to chiropractic that much till I had a had a case with Dan Finch, which was a very good lawyer from Nashville with the McGugan firm that I had known in law school. He was two years ahead of me in law school. And uh, he was used to to dealing with chiropractors here in Nashville more so and we had this case together and he came down and, and, and we deposed this chiropractor. Well, he went in with an aggressive cross-examination of the chiropractor that I thought was tremendous, and I started adopting some of his measures. We would, we would, I would question him about the, uh, his qualifications. You know, they, they, most of your chiropractic schools, you had to have two years of college, and you could get in, and then you had uh, uh, six semesters Three years of chiropractic school, and and that was it. But they thought that they that they would uh, were qualified to to give impairment ratings, and and just like doctors, you know. Well, one of the things that I would do would point out that that they were they always call themselves doctors, but I wouldn't call them doctors. I say you're a chiropractor so and so, and I said you're you're a doctor a chiropractor, just like me and the posing attorney are are doctors of jurisprudence. We don't we don't insist in being called doctors, and I would and I would go through a series of things about, 
asked him why if the patient's neck was hurting, why he, he x-rayed his uh, his back and and, uh, and uh, lower back, and and ran up those expenses, and asked him if he if he was concerned about the effects that the radiation might have on the the, the, the patient's uh, body, and and to go through a series of things, and then. And then he would come out and almost invariably, he would give them the impairment rating. And I would say, and all of your six weeks of, tra of treatment of this chiropractor, with this $10,000 bill, the, the uh, client is still no better than he was when you started treating him. And you know, of course, they'd always have an excuse for that. But they would come out and, and I would have the, uh, I'd have the statute which said what chiropractors could do in front of me. And of course, that was usually put them on the defensive because they would be afraid. They, they weren't sure they knew what they could do, what they couldn't do themselves. And they would usually uh, be afraid that I was going to catch them in uh, unauthorized practice of law or something. So that would make them defensive. But I would go through with the list where one of the things it says is you can't do any, any uh, you can't get prescribe any medicine. I'd say, in other words, that means that, that you can't even give the patient a, a aspirin. Yeah, that's right. And, and no invasive process. In other words, you can't you can't take the patient's temperature with a with an oil thermometer. You got to do it either rectally or under the arm, so forth. Yeah, that's right. And and see, it go through several things there, and it was uh, it ended up with uh, uh, the couldn't couldn't do any. Uh, I forget the term, hematic uh, procedures, which meant, and I said, in fact, you can't even give the patient an enema, can you? And I'd used to wind it up with, with with that, being able to to, to give, not be able to give the patient an enema. And I found out that it was, uh, it, it, it was it's pretty effective. We tried a lot of cases with chiropractors, and the jury would come back and would uh, not even award as much as the chiropractor's bills on that. When did you first become actively involved in bar associations? Right after I started practicing law with the Sheltons, uh, we represented the LNN Railroad Company, which was one of our better clients. We did a, we did a lot of uh, litigation for them in grade crossing accidents, and uh, they were headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. And in conjunction with the bar association, each year they would have a dinner for their uh, local and state attorneys over the over the whole state of Tennessee and uh, the, we were always invited at the Shelton's uh, Hugh Shelton Jr. and Sr. thought it was important for us to go to those meetings and uh, excuse me and they wanted one or both of them would usually go and they encouraged me to go so I started attending the bar conventions primarily to go to the railroad uh, banquets and uh, of course, I I got to know uh, lawyers from all over the state, and you know made friends from lawyers all over the state. And I got to looking forward to each year going and seeing some of those friends that I wouldn't see for for during the year. And over the years, that 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 grew into some friends that I had statewide, and and I continued to look forward to going to the uh, bar association conventions. And I didn't miss, uh, I very seldom ever missed one until I, I, I got sick uh, year, last year or two. Uh, what, are, what are some of the roles that you've done for the bar association that, that you found meaningful? Well, I think one of the more important jobs I had, one of the toughest jobs I had was, uh, was a hearing examiner for the Board of Professional Responsibility. Uh, that, of course, before, before I, when I started practicing law, there was no Board of Professional Responsibility. The only, only enforcement of the ethics we had was locally, and that was through volunteer uh, service, and it was really uh, not very effective. And when, when the Board of, of uh, uh, when the, our procedure of legal ethics was, uh, was adopted, then uh, Lance Bracey, he wasn't the first, but he became the... Uh, 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 disciplinary council, and and the uh, I was appointed as one of the hearing examiners, and we heard some, we heard some very important cases, and they were they were tough cases, really, 
but I think that it is uh, one of the uh, important functions that uh, that we were able to play in that, and that and that has been a tremendous success as far as I'm concerned. The uh, whole machinery that's set up for lawyers to discipline themselves, and it's still continued today to be a great success as far as I'm concerned. Why has it been important for you to stay involved in bar association matters? Well, uh, you know, it's still part of the same reason I was talking about, just being able to, uh, to see some of my friends throughout the state that I don't get to see ordinarily uh, uh, but once a year. And of course, it, I think it's through the Bar Association that, that led me to get interested in the Bar Foundation which is another field that I have enjoyed working in. Uh, uh, some of my friends like uh, Paul Camel and Al Harvey and Bill Leach, and some of them have got me interested in the, uh, the Bar Foundation work. And of course, when I came aboard in, uh, I don't know, maybe the, uh, I don't, maybe the 1980s, somewhere in there, of course, Barry was, uh, was was running it like she still is today, and has has always been very efficient, and nobody's ever ever seen any reason to look for anyone else, and uh, and and she continues to to run it, and and uh, I progressed up through the ranks of uh, of you know sitting on the uh, the, the uh, grants committee and uh, the various jobs that you need to go through to. Uh, to work your way up to chairman, and I became chairman, and uh, and really have uh, have since uh, since then become less active. But I've always tried to attend the meetings, and I enjoy seeing some of them. And I I still uh, think that the uh, the Bar Foundation is uh, is is a great organization to be a part of because we got we got the you got more of the outstanding lawyers and judges over the entire state. Uh, involved in it. And I believe when uh, you were involved with the uh, Bar Foundation, you helped start the ball rolling for this legal history project. How did that come Well, about? I think so, and Barry will correct me if, if I'm wrong, but the year that I was uh, chairman-elect, uh, we, we, we met uh, four times a year, I think, quarterly. And, uh, and you know, I thought the, the Bar Foundation was doing great work. In, in distributing the older work, but it, my, my thinking was that we got all this talent together, we could do more, we could be doing more. And I asked Barry to look around for some some projects that where she attended the, uh, the uh, national conventions of the bar executives, bar foundation executives, to be looking for some, some another project. And she came back, and I don't know if she reported on one or two, but she finally reported one on uh, this uh, legal history thing that I think she said that she found they were doing it in South Carolina, I believe. And that's when I thought that that sounded like a, a good idea, and the board adopted it. And uh, I'm proud to say that the first, the first interview was of Shep Tate that was conducted by Paul Summers, Paul Summers was then the Attorney General, was was on the board, and of course Shep Tate was was almost unquestioned the outstanding lawyer in Tennessee. Had been uh, outstanding lawyer for many years, been president of the American Bar Association, and had been uh, you know just outstanding. And he was uh, certainly the one that deserved to be interviewed first. And then I don't know uh, how it came about, but I'm sure if if I used whatever influence I could to be able to interview Evans Harwell as the second one, because I, Evans had always been a great friend and a mentor of mine. And the second one we were able to do where I interviewed Evans Harwell. And uh, that was uh, that was the beginning of that. Uh, you, you've written your autobiography, which you entitle A Study in Perseverance, to share with family and, and close friends. Uh, what prompted you to to want to record your life uh, in an autobiography? Well, I guess it's first. I guess my daughter, Lindy, who is uh, very much in, in my life still, and her children uh, lives in Merseburg. 
And, uh, you know, she knew enough about my background the of growing up in the country without any electricity, running water, hitting or the uh, one room country school house and so forth, that this was something that was not usual for today's time. And she prompted me to uh, start writing to, uh, to record some of those things for the benefit of her and, and our son and, and her children. And so I started, I started off primarily the, what I was, uh, what, what now is, is not as meaningful to people like you uh, about my early childhood was what I was trying to convey to my grandchildren that where they would be able to know that, uh, that, that things didn't always, weren't always what they were. And then, then you know, I, I just kept on going and I, and I, I kept, uh, writing on it over a period of probably four or five years and I think the uh, I think the theme if anything that runs through my life is uh, is that of perseverance I've, you know every time I've always come out with a with a real obstacle I've always been able to overcome it just by s sticking with it and, and perseverance and I think that was a natural form for the title to, to my book study and perseverance. Did, did you find the writing of your autobiography hard work or was it fun? It was hard work. Yeah, it was. Uh, one thing, uh, I had, uh, you know, practically all of my uh, legal career I had dictated to secretary and I didn't have to worry about uh, grammar, spelling, punctuation, and this type of thing. Well, I determined to do this by writing it out in my handwriting where I wouldn't take the secretary's uh, time at the office. I, was, uh, I wasn't going to impose on my partners to furnish that, so I set out and write it in my handwriting. And I found that that was a, a mistake because uh, I could not spell, I couldn't use proper punctuation. The secretaries, people who transcribed it couldn't read my writing. And it came out with a type product that was full of errors. So it was a lot of time spent in getting the arrows out of it, and it it uh, it had to be proofread numerous times, and uh, before I got all the errors out of it. Okay. And it. You've talked some about your parents and your grandparents and your siblings growing up. Uh, tell us some more about your wife, your children, and your grandchildren. Well. <laughs> I've got I can I can brag on my grandchildren all, more than most people because uh, of course my daughter Lindy lives in Mercer and she's been my uh, primary caretaker caregiver since I've been sick and I lived with there I lived with them for two or three months before I was <coughs> before I was diagnosed with what I had and 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 after I was diagnosed with with uh, ALS and uh, and then. Uh, you know, the her she has she has two children. One of them are fifteen, and one's thirteen. The little girl is is fifteen, and the, both of them are just delightful children. They are both smart. They do. They go to uh, uh, Mercer, Bank, Rutherford County Magnet School. They both like school. They do well. They make straight A's. They are they are polite, and uh, they're just. Uh, they just the main things I got going for me right now is is my grandchildren. What are my your son, my son? He lives in Jacksonville, Florida. He does all right, but I'm not I'm not closely contact with him. He calls say every couple of weeks and checks on when we have normal conversation. But I have uh, I have daily contact with my daughter Lindy. That lives in Mercer. What is Lindy's full name? Her name is uh, it's Lindsay. Uh, uh, Jane Lindsay, Jane Lindsay Lawwell. She married she married David Gagnon, so her last name is Gagnon, G A G N O N. Yes, and what what is uh, what's your son's uh, full name? He's Thomas Edward Lawwell Jr. All right, and uh, your grandchildren's full name? Okay, uh, uh, Lindsay. Excuse me. Well. Uh, her name is uh, uh, 
Lindsay Annette Gagnon. And they, we, we, Lyndon, Lyndon is what we, Lyndon is what we call her. The son's name is, uh, is uh, David Ryan Gagnon. David is, uh, Ryan is, uh, he's 13, he's 13. All right, and uh, what, what, uh, your, your, tell us about your marriage and your wife's full name. Okay, Jane, uh, Jane was Nichols. I married her, met her and married her after I got to Columbia. Uh, she, we, we met on uh, St. Patrick's Day of, uh, of 1962, uh, March 17th. We married uh, immediately. We married a, a year, exactly a year later, uh, on St. Patrick's Day of 1963. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we wanted, both of us wanted to have children. We tried to have children. She had, we found out that Jane's uh, fallopian tubes were stopped. She could not, uh, she could, could not conceive. So both our children were adopted. We adopted uh, Lindy first and then Tommy. Uh, and they, they've both been adopted. And they, you know, that has never been a, never been a factor as far as the adoption is concerned. And how long were you married? Well, we was married from, uh, it was over 50 years. Jane died uh, June the uh, uh, 6th of this year, 13. Okay. She was in, uh, she had been ill for three or four years, two or three years before then. She was in assisted living for the last uh, two or three years. Right. Uh, can you tell us some of the hobbies and activities that, that you've uh, enjoyed doing over the years? Well, I'd say I'd say golf would probably be number one. I I started playing golf uh, when when I was just finishing up here at, at uh, Vanderbilt, and I went went down to Columbia and started playing with uh, with Ed Blank and Billy Jack, people I'd known in law school, and uh, and I started playing at a public course there. Uh, it was Big Hollow then. It's uh, Stony Brook Country Club now, and. Uh, I played there every, every time I got a chance, uh, you know, for the last, uh, for the first two or three years. And then I joined the Great Mare Country Club, I believe, in 1965. And I've been a member of the Great Mare Country Club uh, ever since and played golf regularly there up until I got sick last year. And I think you've also enjoyed hunting and gardening. Yeah, uh, hunting was, uh, Three kinds of hunting: uh, quail hunting, dove hunting, and duck hunting. Uh, duck hunting was uh, uh, well. First of all, quail hunting was one of the things that I enjoyed most. Uh, a couple of friends of mine, John Porter and Valden Harwell, that were you know loved to bird hunt. And we could, we kept good bird dogs together. John Porter kept them at his place, and we we quail hunted regularly on the weekends for. 25 more years and quail played out. And then dove hunting has always been a th big event in Murray County. As, as you know, they have, uh, it becomes a social event as well as a, as a sporting event. And b dove hunting is big and I've always enjoyed that. And in recent years, I've started duck hunting with some friends. We've hunted at Real Foot Lake and at Brinkley, Arkansas and uh, Stuttgart, Arkansas. In different places, one of our friends now, Terry Mays, owns a place at Stuttgart, around Stuttgart, and we've been going there for several years, uh, and, and uh, duck hunting. So you know, I've I've enjoyed that for the last few years. I've gotten where I I can't see as well, and ref reflexes not as good. And I I can't hit as I can't shoot as well as I used to, and I really. Uh, and don't enjoy killing them as much as I used to. I mean, it just, you know, now I just love for the, go out and, and, and the, uh, the great outdoors and see them fly and, and enjoy that as much as anything. Last year in 2012, uh, you received a serious medical diagnosis, but then a reprieve uh, shortly afterwards. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Uh, I was in what I thought was exceptionally good health uh, up until about April of 2012. I got up every morning at uh, 6.30, walked a mile and a half, rain or shine, seven days a week. I was still playing golf three or four days a week. And then 
all of a sudden I came out with a very sore neck and it was diagnosed as stenosis, which meant the, uh, the uh, canal between uh, my third and fourth cervical vertebrae was blocked with a, with a uh, arthritic spurring. And uh, I was first sent by my orthopedic from Columbia to a neurosurgeon in, in Nashville, Dr. Vaughn Allen, who was reputed to be one of the better neurosurgeons in Nashville. And uh, he just refused to operate on it. He said it was too dangerous that he wouldn't, and the only way he would operate on it was was to to prevent complete paralysis. And meanwhile, I was go very well going to complete paralysis. I had, had fallen at home and I couldn't stay at, stood stay at my house and so I had moved to my daughter's house in Murfreesboro, Lindy, and, uh, and uh, finally uh, they, uh, uh, I wound up uh, going to a neurologist there in, in Nashville at, over at Baptist Hospital, Dr. Strickland. And he thought I had some type of autoimmune disease. And he was wanted it confirmed by either the, the neurology department at Vanderbilt or at uh, Walter Reed Hospital. And he was going to try to get me in Walter Reed or Vanderbilt. And of course, I wanted to go to Vanderbilt, but he liked to never got me in at Vanderbilt. And meanwhile, my condition was deteriorating every day and I got to where I couldn't walk. And finally, on the advice of my orthopedic, Dr. Wiseman from Columbia, I got the ambulance to call Murfreesboro and submitted myself to the emergency room at Vanderbilt. That's the way I got admitted to Vanderbilt. And the next day, the uh, a team of neurologists diagnosed my condition as LS, LA, LS, ALS, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease which I knew very well was a uh, no known cure. And, uh, and of course that, that meant that I spent uh, two weeks in Stallworth before they really f trying to figure out what we were gonna do. And I didn't know what I was gonna do, but, you know, and I wound up uh, as makeshift, uh, not knowing anything else better to do, going back to my daughter's house in Mercer, so we could uh, get in the, some type of uh, nursing home or something more suitable. I had to decide whether I was going back to Columbia or stay in Mercer. And I, of course, I wanted to go back to uh, Columbia, but I knew my primary caregiver was uh, Lindy with her two children, and it would be a lot easier for her to stay in Mercer. But then, uh, fortunate, and this sounds weird, but before I was leaving Stallworth, they wanted me to, uh, the the ALS, the top ALS doctor there, wanted to me to, to have another MRI to see whether my condition was worsening or, or getting better. And he was contemplating putting a feeding tube uh, in my navel before I got any worse to be able to to sustain myself with the uh, uh, ALS. And uh, it was a result of that, uh, of that, uh, um, MRI. MRI. No, yeah, that, uh, that somebody else, well, they said they were, I'll call, they'll call you about the results. I waited about three weeks and hadn't heard anything. I called back, I got the nurse for the department. And she said, oh, you want to know the results of your uh, MRI? I said, yeah, that's what I want to know. She said, well, I'll have to look at it. And she went and looked at it and said, well, said, I'm going to have to get a doctor to call you. And that apparently was the first time that anybody had looked at it. And she realized that there was, uh, there was something different there. And it wasn't long until a Dr. Clark, who was one of the same doctors who had diagnosed it, the ALS, called me and says, we believe that there might be, uh, there might be that you might have something else other than ALS. And we want you to see a neurosurgeon at Vanderbilt. 
So wound up with with a uh, with an appointment of uh, uh, Doctor. Um, oh, I can't think of his name. At Vanderbilt neurosurgeon, and uh, and he said that uh, he thought that my problem was that uh, uh, stenosis of the thing, and that, that he could operate on it and co co could correct it. And uh, then, disappointingly, it was six weeks after that before we could get the surgery uh, scheduled. And when I had it, and and I don't. I don't know that uh, that the delay had anything to do with it or not, but I wound up with some nerve damage. The stenosis was corrected, but I wound up with nerve damage, which I still have, and limited use of my arms, legs, and uh, other parts of, of my body. But you have learned that you do not have ALS right. or Lou Gehrig's disease, and has that new diagnosis and getting a reprieve from that, has that changed your view of life any? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still not ready to turn it in. I still have my, uh, I still have a lot of things. I was, uh, after I was able to to get back to driving, I spent two months in the life care center there in Columbia, uh, having physical therapy, and uh, and still was able to be dismissed home, but I still couldn't drive for a while. I had to have a, a wrestling match with my doctor to get that straightened out. But anyway. Uh, I've been able to go back home and with uh, with some domestic help, uh, live at home, been able to drive. I go to the uh, YMCA to do my exercises six days a week. I go to the office for an hour or so every day to to talk to my law partners. I'm able to go out to the club, meet lunch, and uh, and go home and do a lot of reading and watch a lot of ball games at night. So uh, you know, I, I think I've Still got a little quality of life that's uh, that's uh, worth hanging on to. After your medical problem last year in 2012, did you keep your law license? No, I did not. Uh, that was one of the things after with the uh, diagnosis of uh, ALS and and the fee that's required of what $500, $500 every year. I said there's no need of paying that, so I voluntarily surrendered my law license. And uh, after I've after I've been able to uh, get out from under that death sentence, I've I've decided that I really don't care to practice law anymore. I'm, I'm, I don't have the physical and mental stamina that's required to practice law, and I don't care about uh, I don't care about uh, practicing anymore. I'm, I still have potential clients that are call me up, but I'm happy to refer them to one of my law partners, Frank, Frank Dale or Bill Graham. And, and uh, that frugality comes through again, too. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you enjoy reading a lot. What yeah. kind of things do you enjoy reading? <laughs> okay, I, I, I read history. I'm a big history reader. I've read, I read everything I can get my hands on about the Civil War and World War II. And now I've got off into... Uh, you know, historical novels, uh, anything that I can can see that's different. Uh, one of the one of the more interesting books that I've read recently is uh, it's quite fascinating to me. It, it's it's um, it's titled uh, "Life Behind the Enemy Lines in Middle Tennessee in 1863 to 65." And there's, there's a uh, history professor, the name is uh, Bradley, I believe, that's over at Motlow State. And he has gotten the records of the Provo Marshal. And you know, this is something that never occurred to me. How, how, how does uh, law and order, how is law and order maintained behind enemy lines? Okay, after the, uh, after the, uh, the Yankees had pushed Bragg and the Southern Army out of Murfreesboro and, and, and on toward Chattanooga and had, had taken over uh, Middle Tennessee and, and uh, Shedville, Tullahoma, McMinnville, uh, Fedville, and that area. There was a provost marshal office established in Tullahoma. And, and this professor of history had been able to find those records of the provost marshal's office during those times. And you're talking about some 
some vigilante type of justice that was handed out. I mean, they were still neighbors fighting neighbors and, and, uh, and, and still going on in the way they were, were getting uh, uh, reprimands against each other and, and, uh, and things were going on. And when the, how, the, uh, how the slaves who had freed, how they, they were able to, to, uh, to gather around the, uh, the Union Army, you know, and how they were treated by the Union Army and such as that. And it's a, it's a small little book, but it's really fascinating to me and how, uh, how, even, how uneven justice was handed out by the provost marshal, really, on, on just uh, any type of, I mean, somebody can come in. And one of the things their records consist of is affidavits, you know, that, that complaints would make their affidavits and they would swear that Oh, so and so had done such and such to them, and those provost marshal they could they could have them brought in and summarily punished, their houses burned and uh, and you know them some of them even hung, just based on what the uh, what the complaints was made against them, and that that was really uh, really fascinating to me about that. Do you have any advice for a young lawyer coming out of law school and going into practicing law, how to be successful, how to enjoy practice? Well, I think the first of all is uh, the choice, the decision is going to have to be made as to what type of lawyer the person wants to do, what, what type of law he wants to practice. I mean, if you're talking about the uh, the general practice of law in the small town like you and I grew up on, you know, that's one thing, but that's that's all sort the of dying breed, you know. It, we're more, moving more and more into specialties, and uh, there's more and more uh, regulatory work to be done, government work to be done, and, and this type of thing. But uh, I, I think that... Uh, I think the same thing that makes a person successful in law are, are the same things that makes a person successful in most everything else, and that is being uh, making wise decisions, working, uh, and uh, taking care of your business as it comes in, whether you're a, whether you're a lawyer or a banker or a doctor or whatever it is. It's just being able to. Uh, to, to carry out your work in an orderly manner and, and do your job as it comes in, really, I think is what you need to do to be successful. Practice law and most anything else. Have you been satisfied with your life? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I couldn't imagine when I was growing up that, uh, that I would ever accomplish what I have accomplished and, uh, and been able to, uh, to, to be where I am today. Yeah, right. Is there anything else that we haven't yet covered that you'd like to mention? <laughs> well, we certainly covered a lot of it. Uh, I don't know how much of it is going to be uh, preserved, but uh, I consider it to have been, uh, I consider it an honor to have been asked to, uh, to give this interview. And, uh, and I'm glad to uh, be in the uh, company of the ones that have, have given it in, in, in the past. And I hope it will uh, be of benefit to uh, some lawyers in the future. You've relished uh, practicing law as, as much as any lawyer I've been as associated with. So I think I know uh, the answer to this. And this is my final question. But uh, would you choose law uh, as a career again? And, and if so, why? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there'd be any question about that. Uh, well, you know, like I said, I think it's uh, I think it's service. I think the main thing that you're we're after is to to perform a service and to to make a good, honest living. Uh, I have not I've not uh, become wealthy. I've been comfortable and then still am, and uh, I've got uh, you know a comfortable life and monitor materially, and uh, that's all I can ask for, really. Thank you very much for the interview, Ed Lawwell. All right, okay. All right.